Hello and welcome to Big Deal. I'm Nisha Poddar. Now, REITs and INVITs have, over the last few years, evolved in the country as an important asset class. Now, budget proposal, however, throws some uncertainty in this particular space regarding the returns for the investors, which is so critical. Now, budget proposal um, is to bring under its tax net the income distributed by REITs and INVITs in the form of debt repayment. Let's discuss this issue threadbare with the experts from the industry. Let me welcome on the show tax expert Ajay Roti, who's a partner at Dhruva Advisors. And from the audit side, we have Adarsh Ranka, the partner at EY. Bikas Kodalya is uh, the CEO at uh, Embassy REIT. And Gopal Agarwal is sitting right here in the studio with me, an investment banker at Edelweiss who has worked on many uh, of these uh, being listed on the exchanges. Gentlemen, so good to have you on the show. Now, let's first get an uh, industry view because how uh, does this particular tax proposal impact uh, you as a company? And there have been representations made to the ministry to um, rethink on this or to give some dispensation on this budget proposal. So what's the update coming in on that? Is the government receptive to the idea of a rethink? Yeah, thank you, Nisha. So firstly, uh, you know, the current proposal to tax the debt repayment component impacts the distribution yield by around 50 to 100 basis points, which roughly, if you look at it, REITs being a total return product, you know, envisaging anywhere between mid to high teen return as a target return, it does impact the total return, but, uh, you know, uh, but it's only the distribution component which gets impacted. In terms of what we're doing as industry, we have, we are making suitable representations to authorities, given that this is an attractive product and it has been successful till date, especially with retail investors. While I wouldn't want, wouldn't want to comment on the specifics of the representations being made, but the conversations are broadly around reconsideration of the proposed tax, uh, proposed tax provisions or mitigation measures around this proposal. But, you know, I just want to say that this is a new product. Some teething issues are to be expected, but in general, government and regulators have been very supportive since the launch of the REITs. That we know, um, because in fact, over the years, many changes have been made to make it so attractive for the Indian investors. And now it has really reached that maturity. And also during an interest rate hardening cycle, uh, we expect this part equity, part fixed income kind of asset class to grow in prominence. So at this time, it's definitely coming in as a dampener. Ajay Roti, from the tax perspective, help us understand what is the confusion and the issue all about and how much of it can be really sorted out at the company's level if this tax proposal was to be implemented as is from 1st of April? Yeah, so Nisha, the, the issue is really on, uh, you know, different nature of income that will come from uh, holding REIT units and how those are taxed. And like you said, the government has been proactive, has introduced a special regime for taxation of uh, returns from uh, REIT and the INVIT units. To very simply put, and I won't get into too much uh, technicalities here, uh, it enjoys a pass-through status. These trusts enjoy a pass-through status. Therefore, all streams of income are either taxed in the hands of the investment trust or the unit holder. Uh, and, you know, uh, there are specific treatments for dividends, for interest, and for rental income that the trust earns. Now, there was a fourth category of income that would get distributed, which is really this proceeds from repayment of loan. And that was not being taxed in the hands of the unit holder, nor in the hands of the trust, because it was by nature and on first principles, a capital amount that was received on repayment of loan. What the budget proposal does is to tax this in the hands of the unit holders. And, you know, the, the problem is not just that. The problem is really about the nature of taxation, which is, the budget proposal proposes to tax this as income from other sources, which really means it is at the normal rates. So for all the individuals, it could go as high as 39%. And for foreign investors and other investors, it becomes an other source income, not a capital gains. So even if this were to be taxed, and if this was to be brought into taxation, uh, you know, one consideration could have been, can this be in the nature of capital gains? Because essentially it's that, it's a return of capital, and therefore can you tax it at that? The issue is really that, yeah. which is one is you're taxing it and you're taxing it under the income from other sources head. 
Yes. So that is uh, really uh, the crux of the problem. And uh, we have spoken to actually a lot of uh, the listed REITs as well as INVITs. And, um, you know, others uh, throw more light on this aspect. See, different companies have been impacted in a different manner. Some of the companies have told us, like Indigrid, that they are less impacted. Now, embassy in the past have told us that uh, maybe the returns and the yields to the investors would vary uh, and get impacted by 50 to 100 basis points and 40% of the cash distribution comes under this. And that particular figure really varies. So why this differentiation and can this be changed overnight? Right. So Nisha, if we compare across the REITs and the invits, right, uh, the loan repayment component varies from a 4% to a 48%. So there's a lot of variance depending on the structure. Now, uh, that's, I would say, one of the key reasons why um, more, many of the trusts have a different uh, view in terms of the level of impact in their particular case. If I also look at a comparison between a REIT and an INVIT, generally the INVITs are more leveraged. So even between a REIT and an INVIT, the INVIT is expected to have a larger impact because the loan repayment component would be higher in terms of the distribution component. Now, in, in terms of, uh, if I look at the second part of your question, right, I think with the proposed amendment, the way I think Ajay mentioned, if you look from a unit holder's perspective, since dividend income is going to be exempt, right, I think the intent of the trust and the objective of the trust would be to distribute more dividend rather than the loan repayment, yes. if the way uh, the amendment currently stands. Yes. Hence, in terms of, I think the impact, Clearly, what would be critical in terms of the impact would be the capital structure, the reserves, reserve position, and the cash flow. And let me take a quick example. Yeah. So if there's a company which has a lot of cash flows which is generating, yes. it would need to have positive reserves to distribute dividend yeah. and vice versa. So I think having a balanced approach in terms of a capital structure and alignment with between the reserve and the cash flow position, I think would really be important from a company, uh, from a trust perspective. Right. Uh, so that's why the differentiation uh, and uh, the difference in impact on different companies. Uh, but Gopal, uh, you know, while making this particular asset class attractive, the investors had to keenly look at their yields, the returns, the redemption of units is one thing, but the fixed income is something which is the most attractive part and right now, with interest rates going up, it will continue to be the attractive uh, bit for the REITs and invit space as an asset class. So, uh, as an investment banker, do you think that this particular tax proposal, if implemented, is going to uh, reduce the attractiveness and what's going to be the impact on the investors, according to you? So, as rightly pointed out by you, Nisha, this is a fixed income product. Uh, typically, the driver for this is basically what is my post-tax yield. Yes. which I'm getting from this yes. uh, investments. Yes. Uh, and as you know, uh, some of us kind of commented on this, uh, this could have an impact of anything between, let's say, 50 to 100 bips, you know, yes. on my yield. Yes. Uh, and, you know, compared to, let's say, a fixed deposit, the delta was roughly around 150 to 200 bips. Hmm. The delta got gets kind of reduced. So to the extent, of course, would this have a short-term impact, uh, you know, if the t uh, this was to get implemented? The answer is yes. Uh, but I'm sure in the long term, people will figure out, you know, kind of a, some kind of a structuring solution. Yes. Uh, because... The point remains that, you know, or let me look at it, you know, from a uh, tax perspective. All they're saying is that any form of distribution should be taxed. Yes. While as the nature of distribution is basically nothing but a repayment of capital. Hmm. Uh, when you look at debentures, when you look at bonds, when you look at anything else, yes. uh, there is a different treatment when you know when you return the capital. While yes. as here, it is treated differently. Hmm. Uh, so my sense is in short term, it would have some impact uh, yes. for sure. But in term, long term, I'm sure we'll be able to kind of uh, resolve for this. Right. Uh, but Gopal, the double non-taxation is something that the government tried to plug and it created so much of uncertainty for the entire sector, which I'm sure the government had also not anticipated given the varying nature across various companies which are in the listed REIT and INVIT space. But Vikas, how are your investors really reacting uh, to this? Um, are they raising concerns about this, about their yield proposition? I mean, 1% of uh, their post-tax return uh, coming down is actually a big number. Yeah, so Nisha, there are two parts to this one. Obviously, there is uncertainty, as all our panelists mentioned. So, you know, we'll need to work with the authorities. Uh, they have been supported in the past to see how we can remove the uncertainty on how the whole taxation works. Because even today, the 
SPV debt amortization or repayment of debt we are speaking about was being treated as towards repayment of capital to some you know in some form. So I think that that clarity needs to emerge. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, retail investors are seeking uh, explanations or clarifications on how this will work. But more importantly, I think if I to, want to take a step back, we mentioned about rising interest rates. We mentioned about total return. I just want to say that a lot large part of our effort since the last four years we got listed has been on retail investor education of how in India this product is a total return product. Unlike yes. you would say it's a fixed uh, yield product in some of the other countries, simply because the growth element is 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 huge uh, from an India context. And again, I mentioned last time we are undertaking record development. Uh, there's a lot of growth to the NOI uh, since we listed till date. And, you know, both in terms of inorganic acquisitions as well as our organic initiatives, you know, the growth will translate into NOI and distribution. So, you know, from a medium to long term perspective, this is still a very attractive investment uh, proposition for retail investors. And a lot of the investors do understand that. I think it's just the short term. There has been uncertainty. Uh, you know, again, that's being reflected in the way we're seeing uh, performance, but we believe that this will correct itself over the course of time. You spoke about uh, retail investors, but because any word from the sponsors, the big private equity players, the foreign players who are invested in, uh, you know, REITs and invits like yours, they had come with a lot of exuberance to India and they are the ones who have pumped in a huge amount of cash to make REITs and invits so successful so far. So any word and concern from that category of investors so far? Yeah, you know, from a foreign institutional investor perspective, we have a you know a book comprising some of the leading names uh, globally. You know, one a lot of them are sophisticated investors. They have been invested in REIT product globally, so they understand the total return aspect of it. So from that perspective, they are more focused on the growth levers and what are we doing to create value from a long term perspective. However, in the immediate term, uh, we understand that they would also want to seek more clarity, and that will help both in increasing participation from retail investors, which really helps in better price discovery and efficiency in the market. So I think overall, you know, a, you know, a, a suitable representations, hoping, hopefully uh, leading to better clarity on the way to tax this will lead to mo more participation from retail investors, which also then overall helps all the investors in better discovery, efficient price discovery mechanism. So I think right. it's all linked. They understand that this impacts in the short term. They're just more focused on, okay, how can we resolve this? And how could uh, how could how fast could you just um, make representations to the government and get more clarity? That's that's their focus. Right. Uh, so more representation and Vikas, uh, of course, uh, people in the industry know that you were on the investor side at one point and now the CEO of one of uh, the REITs as well. So, all right, gentlemen, hold your thought a little more to discuss on the confusion and the conundrum what uh, the budget has really thrown on this particular space as an asset class reads and in which we'll discuss more on that when we return after this very short break on Big Deal. Stay tuned. Welcome back. You're watching Big Deal and we are discussing the impact of budget on REITs and INVITs as an asset class. Now, uh, Ajay Roti, we were discussing the tax conundrum after the budget proposal where the representations have been made for dispensation or a rethink by the government. But there's one more point on the debt repayment uh, as part of the income distribution, which has come under the tax net as part of the budget proposal. There's one issue that has been raised by some of uh, the people who have reached out to us to understand this, that um, only a part of it is uh, going to be taxed. Only the piece over cost of acquisition is the one uh, portion of debt repayment which stands to be taxed. But then there is also SEBI regulation which also does not permit part redemption of REIT and INVIT trust. Where, what is this confusion about and what is your thought process on the solution for it? Right. So, uh, Nisha, the, the, the problem is really because the main provision which has been brought in to tax this uh, receipt, which is the debt repayment portion, uh, says that this will be taxed as other sources. But there's a carve out. It says that, however, if this portion is being paid as a part of the redemption, then you will get a deduction for the cost of acquisition, which is if somebody were to buy a unit at, say, 300 rupees, and then you got uh, some portion of 
uh, the debt repayment as a part of the redemption when the units are redeemed, then you can deduct this cost that is there. But that is at this point uh, academic because right, like you rightly pointed out, the SEBI regulations don't permit a part redemption. Uh, you know, according to me, the way that they have said that this has to amount in a reduction of the cost of acquisition is how they should have addressed the entire amount of loan repayment. Because essentially, on first principles, this is a capital that is coming back. Therefore, you reduce your cost of acquisition, which is to say, just taking the same example, if somebody bought the unit at 300 rupees, and then you over a period of time got various amounts as loan repayment, you keep reducing your cost. And then when you eventually sell it, you get a lower cost base. What this does is all these receipts get taxed as capital gains. They don't go untaxed, but they get taxed as capital gains, which is the right way to tax it. Therefore, yes. the way they've done a carve out for redemption is how the entire provision in my view should have come and that would have solved a lot of problems. Right. And uh, others taking all these confusions and various technicalities into account, uh, is there a solution that you're already proposing to your clients on this? Can there be a change in the structure as well as the way the distribution is done? So, Nisha, while uh, the I mean impact cannot be completely negated, but there are clearly some mitigating uh, steps that can be taken. So, if I look at broadly two areas, first, trust which are looking at listing, naturally they have a flexibility to revisit the capital structure and that many of them are evaluating. Uh, if I look at the current listed trust, maybe there are two, three things they could look at. Uh, the first is because this amendment would be applicable from 1st April 23, yes. right? They could look at maximizing their distribution under the repayment loan repayment option yes. before 31st March 23. That's something which will help. Yes. While in principle possible, how practically it will happen, I think we'll have to see. Right. The second thing many of them are looking at is tax arbitrage. Yes. Like Ajay said, uh, if loan repayment distribution would be taxable as income from other sources, which is at a higher rate, Mm. Uh, if through restructuring uh, some of the SPVs, yes. the REIT could the trust could generate long term capital gain, yes. then from a unit holder, the tax arbitrage is possible. Right. And then again, some other things like uh, distribute uh, dividend, distributing dividend. But if you have negative reserve, mm. can you look at some of your accounting policies? So there are two three things which I think many com many trusts are looking at right. to mitigate the impact. All right. And uh, Gopal, uh, how does it impact uh, the future pipeline uh, going forward as well as the attractiveness? And uh, have you already seen some of your future uh, you know, prospects really raising concerns about it? We know at least one big private equity firm uh, is planning for a REIT and BIT listing, a REIT listing. So I think as far as the attractiveness of this, uh, uh, let's say, asset class is concerned, uh, Disha, uh, as I said, you know, there is FD which is giving you 4-5% return and post-tax is like, you know, hardly anything. I mean, leave apart the, some of the re recent interest hikes. Uh, it doesn't even cover for inflation. Uh, REIT and Invit definitely provided investors, you know, whether it is, uh, ret uh, you know, the retailers, yeah. the HNIs or, you know, I would say even the foreigners. Yes. Uh, with an asset class which could give them, uh, let's say, X amount of anything between, let's say, 8 to 9% or even 10% yield right. over a long period of time. So from that perspective, the attractiveness of the uh, asset class is for sure there. Uh, as I said, in short term, people will evaluate, you know, in terms of how this whole tax thing They'll comes. Bake in, They'll uh, bake in. They'll bake in. This particular uh, but tax But to me, uh, honestly, there is enough and more, I would say, kind of a uh, gap, you know, in terms of having uh, this as a product, while as there's enough and more investors who are looking at, you know, investment opportunities. Uh, to, so to me, I, I think this could be a bit of a short term phenomena, uh, which will kind of uh, overcome, uh, let's say, sooner than later. Uh, but I, I don't think so. This should really impact... Uh, their mood, the pipeline uh, also? No, of I, I don't think it, it, it could get delayed a bit because, as I said, we'll have to work with some of our clients on the uh, structuring part of it. Uh, right. uh, but I don't think so. Uh, it you know, it would kind of uh, dampen the mood. All right. Ever, ever optimist uh, 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 investment banker, I must say. But uh, final question to you, Vikas. Uh, does it change the prospects and the way you raise funds in the future? and the structuring of that very quickly. And what are you expecting uh, for the government to do uh, in this regard? Nisha, I mean, we are here for the long term to create value long term. So, you know, I think from a business perspective, the way we would look at financing, whether it's debt or equity, nothing changes. We continue to ex execute on the business strategy. We want to create long term value and we're continuing the construction, the leasing mark to market, and also looking at potential acquisition. So nothing changes 
really from a medium long term perspective doing the business with the same strategy the same core four pillars we had laid down and just yeah. from a government perspective from the government and and, and the regulator perspective we'll continue to work with them continue to uh, make suitable representations and we are hopeful uh, you know that they will uh, they will they will they will uh, consider the request and representations being made by the industry all right a lot of uh, work is going on on making these representations and let's see what dispensation can come in or is it going to be the order of the day but i must say reits and invits have become a prominent asset class and only to become more useful for the investors given its fixed income nature along with the unit upside that also can be taken care of so equity as well as fixed income combination makes it very suitable for investment and that's what the government had looked at when they first started and in fact a market regulator is also very keen for this particular product to really come up in a big way and on the other hand for capital intensive sectors it's a great way of offloading assets and raising money Uh, for the future assets to be also executed with that it's a wrap on this edition of big deal thank you so much gentlemen for coming in and sharing all your views on this very technical subject thanks so much